And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple. Coming to coming to us all coming to us all the way from all the way from the land be, from the land beyond. Also also known as some, somewhere outside somewhere outside of the mists of time zones. <laughs> the one and only Jeff D. Thanks for com thanks for coming back on this one. Hi Mildra, happy to be back. Mm -hmm. Um so we had kind we had kind of touched on Tecumel the last time that I had you on, but because of how wide of a net we were casting with that, that was something that we didn't really have the opportunity to really delve into. And as I started doing my own research on um, Tecumel, and something that I be something that I began to realize is that this is a setting that I think that. I decided I want to try and to give as much of a spotlight as I can with the, with the platform that I have, sim simply because of what's in it. Mm -hmm. um, and I will freely admit the same thing that I admitted um, when I discussed Lord of the Rings uh, about a month ago. And that is, no matter how much research I end up doing... There is, I can't, I can't help but shake the feeling that my knowledge will always be dwarfed at, to some degree, by my ignorance. And I'm well, I'm well aware that I'm a poor, that I'm a poor layman when it, when it comes to this, but at the very least, I can make attempts to narrow that gap. Yeah. And, and, and hence, and hence this, this grand return, this is, this is of course going to focus solely on te on te on Tecumel. And the first thing the first thing that that I suppose I should ask just to just to set the stage is for the ben for the benefit of the of those in the temple what it what is te what is Tecumel to you and and um what was it about the, what do you suppose it is about that setting that draws people um so tecumel is a science fantasy setting that was created by uh m a r barker mm -hmm. who uh at the at the time when the the first game using the setting which was tsr's empire of the petal throne uh, 1975 i think um at the time when it came out, he was a professor of South Asian studies at the University of Minnesota, which is like your backyard, right? Didn't you just tell me that you're from Minnesota? Yeah. Um, so this, I'm actually telling you stuff that's from your people. <laughs> uh, uh, so he, um, he was a world traveler and science fiction fan, like going all the way back to the 50s when the very first science fiction conventions started happening he was an attendee and was going around meeting famous science fiction authors and getting their autographs and stuff and he started developing this setting uh with the goal of eventually writing novels that would take place in that setting but uh he was also a gamer and uh you know back in those days this is pre-role playing uh, that meant tabletops full of miniature figures. Mm -hmm. And he actually uh, came up with uh, sets of rules for uh, for doing tabletop miniatures battles on the planet Tecmo um, and hand-carved armies of figures from his world because you couldn't buy them in stores, right? It was all mm -hmm. in his head. Um, so anyway, he, uh, he spent decades... No, actually, he he said that the the initial spark of an idea from it came from when he was like 15 years old, and his parents bought him a book about Egyptian hieroglyph hieroglyphics, and you know that just got him interested in sort of ancient um, exotic settings. But mainly starting in the 50s and up through the release of Dungeons and Dragons in 70. 
for. Uh, he had this idea for a setting in mind and planned on eventually doing novels and was and was doing tabletop miniatures battles. Mm -hmm. And then D&D hit the college circuit and his gaming group at the university, uh, they started playing D&D. And he took one look at that and said, this is fascinating and amazing, but it's all just warmed over, um, you know, uh, uh, knights of the round table and uh, you know to traditional medieval fantasy stuff come back next week and they came back next week and he had adapted his setting to a set of rules kind of loosely based on original D&D &D and started running games and kept developing that until it was a publishable, publishable product TSR got wind of it and it was actually published by TSR, the first role-playing game that came with a setting packaged with it, and the second role-playing game, I think, of all after Dungeons and Dragons, came out less than a year after original D&D. And um, eventually, uh, when it was published, it was in this great big uh, uh, box with color printing on it, three giant vinyl maps of the, the, the five empires region of the planet and, uh, and a vinyl map of the city of Jakala that was like, you know, the starting place for characters in that setting. And uh, it came out for $25 back in the day when original D&D &D was still you know, three little brown digest sized books in a small box for five bucks. And it was too much too soon and it failed financially and TSR just withdrew it. Uh, that's the, that's like the hobby end of mm -hmm. what Techno is. Um, so it's a science fiction setting. The premise is that um, a few years ago, interestingly, uh, around about the time when Professor Barker actually died in real life was the was the year or approximately the year that he said there was going to be an atomic war that wiped out Western civilization on Earth. And um, so it's all the other people, the, the, the uh, 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 Asians and Australians and Africans and uh, and people of the Orient who picked up the pieces and rebuilt civilization, eventually built mighty starships and went off into space, met up with aliens, uh, fought some, allied with others, and eventually formed a big space empire that went around conquering, terraforming, and colonizing other planets, including the planet Tecumel. Um, which was this, uh, which was this, already occupied planet uh, with a, 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 a hostile race living there that had itself already achieved space travel. Uh, they got basically nuked back to the Stone Age and put into preserves and the, the human space empire moved in, terraformed the planet to make it more uh, amenable to human life and, um, and set up colonies there and uh and took it over mm -hmm. well then uh there was a disaster which has never been fully explained in any of the official published source material but apparently a disaster not limited to the planet tecumel but possibly a consequence of some technology that the empire was using uh resulted in many star systems including the tecumel system uh, dropping into little pocket dimensions of their own. So uh, if you were on that planet, one day the stars went out and, you know, mighty tectonic forces racked the planet and cities crumbled and, and tidal waves washed across the land and, mm -hmm. and stuff. And, uh, and they were cut off from the rest of the, of the space empire. Uh, the game is set about a hundred thousand years after that when the descendants of the colonists and the uh and their and their alien allies have reverted to barbarism but in the pocket dimension where tecumel resides uh, something we can call magic 
it, it is able to operate. And that's where the game takes place. It's a it's a fantasy setting built on the ruins of a high tech interstellar space civilization. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, as I sort of hinted before, it's not medieval fantasy. It's much more kind of you know ancient Babylon's Babylon meets the Aztec Empire. It's what I call like barbaric fantasy, cities of monolithic stone architecture built under the hot sun by legions of toiling slaves and, you know, mighty dark temples to bloodthirsty gods and, um, you know, very, very heavy duty adult stuff. So that's, mm -hmm. that, that, that's, there's a basic mm -hmm. overview. <laughs> yeah. Now, what I'm curious, what I'm cur now within that, I will I will note that one of the things that, for whatever reason, always comes to mind when I think of this whole notion of a cl a um class a um a civilization being built off of this in off of this um interst off this interstellar group in that sense. One of the big one of the big things that ends up coming that ends up coming to mind is um, foundation, and I'm curious yeah. if you if you think that if um you think there is some DNA of of um, Asimov's work within within certain within certain yeah. parts. I I haven't read Foundation mm -hmm. since high school. Uh, I would be hesitant to, hesitant to draw any connections. Yeah. Um, I mean. I, it it seems much more an unex the result of unex unexpected unpredictable um, uh, disasters, right? More a post Holocaust kind of thing mm -hmm. than uh, than than Foundation, which is like brilliant people thinking of uh, in uh, uh, predicting the, where the future is going to go because of how things are going. Um, I don't think so, but it would be fascinating if that turned out to be true, right? If a yeah. hundred thousand years after the disaster, it turns out, oh yeah, all the stuff that's happening with the with the empires and and their battles against the the remnants of the original natives and stuff, all of that was like planned and predicted by geniuses long ago before the disaster. That yeah. would be amazing, but as far as I know, there's no hint of that. Yeah. Um... I, and I will I will admit that was that was more of my own instinct talking out talking on that front now no it's a brilliant question man I, I, it's yeah. got me thinking <laughs> um when it now when it comes when it came to the co the core story the core story of tech mill the way, the way you describe it would it be accurate of yeah. me to say that it was built as a setting first and then store and then the stories were written on it yeah. I, uh, oh, yeah. Sure. He had put decades of work into uh, visualizing the 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 history and the languages and the cultures and all of that with the plan of doing novels, right? Mm -hmm. And then the role playing game even happened before the novels, built on you know his groundwork for the for the novels he was going to going to write. Um, so it's, it, there, uh, yes, yeah. I think, I think the answer to your question is yes, mm -hmm. he did the, he developed the world first. Yeah. Um, now <laughs> when I was doing my own research, I did, I did find out about the novels and I mentioned this a bit before we, en before we ended up going live, but yeah, there were, um, f there were five, no there were five novels and unfortunately my, yeah. Ability to research in, into them was was limited because get because getting these books can be a bit tricky. Aside from the aside from the first novel, The Man of Gold. Right. Um, yeah. The first the first two novels that he wrote came out through. I, I I'm just guessing off the top of my head. I don't have my books in front of me. I think Daw. Yeah. Published them, but I, is D is that correct? Okay. Yeah. D A W um, books. 
Right. Um, and uh, and then the first two novels came out uh, through them. So they had like Michael uh, Whalen covers, or at least mm -hmm. the first one did, mm -hmm. and, uh, and had the benefit of professional editing. And the later novels came out through a much smaller uh, or uh, outfit called Zoltola. I'm not quite sure how that's pronounced. Um, and uh, as far as I know, not that many copies were printed and they as uh, Zotola went out of business and mm -hmm. they're really hard to find. Um, the Tecumel Foundation is trying to get all the old material back into print, but you know, they are, uh, I'm gonna have to come back to them in a bit, but um, they are a small underfunded volunteer organization that is, you know, getting to this stuff as quickly as they can. Yeah. And it's slow. I think they've only got Man of Gold back in print. Now, so now, did, did you did uh, you told me you you found a way to get Man of Gold and Flame Song? Did you actually get them? Um, and and more importantly, did you read either one? I ha I um I was able I was able to I was able to find a, find a means, but um what in, but um think um. Things ended up getting a, li a little bit more in in the last few months. Get a little bit more busy than I had initial and I, that I had initially planned. Um, especially especially given certain projects that I had to um that I had to do, had to do some catch up on. Um, but the only, but when yeah, I did well, some digging I'll, around, I'll be sure. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll be sure not to not to uh, reveal any spoilers. All right. Um, but when I did, when I did, when I tried to do some digging around, the things that I found is that, um, the man of, the man of gold is relatively easier to get, um, flame songs a little bit trickier and the remaining ones are very, are, are very much so more tricky. But from what I understand, from what I understand when I was reading, um, a lot, when I was reading people's accounts of the book would it be fair based on the description that i was given of the man of gold would it be fair to say that in some ways it's in some ways it's kind of a um travelogue of the of parts of the setting um uh, yeah well yeah as a writer barker is very uh enamored of his own setting and you know i think that has to be excused because the setting is so awesome. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so in a sense, yeah, you get led by the nose around a portion of the world, but honestly, not that big of an area. If you think about it in the context of all of the information that's come out about the setting mm -hmm. since that first novel, um, uh, and it's, you know, the job, particularly of the first novel, the job is to introduce the world. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah, I would say the answer to your question is yes, and not in a ter not in a bad way. Mm -hmm. But it is, it is clearly that to a certain extent. Travel. Yeah. But, um, what I ended up what I ended up hearing fur further on is that um, the following novel, Flame Song, is not even though it's in the same setting, it is not a follow up to the Man of Gold. Uh, no, um, and and this is the thing you don't really learn until you get to book three. Um, you know, did you read the uh, Song of uh, Ice and Fire books? Yes, from uh, um, George R. R. Martin. We but... We right. here in the temple have a running gag of think of things that have been released before the winds of winter. So, you know, George R. R. Martin, um, you know, used this gimmick in his books that each chapter followed a different character, mm -hmm. right? And then there's the overall story is woven from their individual uh, adventures. What Barker did is. Um, the first novel introduces the priest Harston. The second novel introduces the uh, the uh, soldier. Oh gosh, now I'm going to forget his name. 
this uh, sorcerer, I'm sorry, the soldier who is in a legion that follows the flame god from Uthla. Mm -hmm. In the third novel, those two characters, Harson and uh, I know this guy's name is going to come to me, and the and the soldier, are both employed by the Empire on a diplomatic mission to a faraway land, but the main and they're so they're it characters in the story. But the main character in the third novel is yet another uh, new main character, uh, the uh, sorcerer Koruka, who is probably my favorite character that Barker wrote about ever, because mm -hmm. he's he's such a pathetic dick. <laughs> um, and uh, and so he he builds his. Uh, it, it, over the course of the first three novels, he introduces these these major main characters separately, and then puts them together in book three, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it 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 comes together in a way that isn't at all obvious in the first two books. All right, um, and also I think it would be equally fair to call the second book a bit of a travelogue. Uh, though in that one they they get on board a tubeway car, which is an ancient sub uh, planet spanning subway system of the ancient colonists, and uh, wind up in uh, a foreign land and uh, and dealing with the weird culture there. Um, and it's it's as much about the weird details of that land as the first novel is about weird details of. The, the the central setting of uh, the empire of Soliano. Mm -hmm. And speak speaking of, speaking of land, what are some, what are some <clears throat> of the what are some of the highlights you can tell me when it comes to the flora and fauna of oh the world where te Tecmil takes place? Because um, so it's a it's it, yeah. Go ahead. It because one of the one of the things that was that I. Um, did end up learning is that when the when the initial cataclysm happened that cut that cut the planet off, um, there were there were certain tr there were certain trades that had that had to quickly adapt because of the because of the fact that when it current when it comes to certain metals the world is a bit lacking. Uh huh. So, but your question was the flora, flora and flora, mm -hmm. uh, flora and flora. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this, yeah. So, what's crazy about Tecumel is it was a planet on which uh, which had its own, like you know, noxious atmosphere and its own uh, evolutionary tree and its own weird life forms that lived there, and then. You know, us invaders came in and paved all that over, and those bits of the or original inhabitants that could survive, adapt, and survive did. But um, in addition to that, uh, the colonists brought in uh, tons of creatures from their home worlds to, uh, you know, to dress the place up and make it more like home. And so, you know, evolution would never be discovered on Tecumel. There's like, you know, a, a, creatures and plants from over a dozen different planets all brought here. And then, you know, in the 100,000 years since the disaster, plus however long, you know, they spent um, terraforming the place in the, in the first place, uh, they've formed their, this, this, own completely unique mix of things that you know it's much more interesting um you know in a gaming on Tecumel to encounter a creature and go oh it's got three eyes arranged horizontally across its face like the Hlaka do who are these like furry bat-winged humanoids that you that are a player race mm -hmm. on Tecumel um, so that that thing's got three eyes across its face. It might be from the from the Hlaka home world, but then somebody else will go, no, but the Hlus, who we know are original, uh, you know, crustacean creatures that lived here before uh, before the planet was conquered, 
they also have three eyes. Yeah, but they're bug-like, and this thing's got three eyes, and it's furry, so that's Flocka. Well, you know, so it's it's there's great mysteries surrounding where these individual things are supposed to have come from. Not terribly important mysteries, because I, yeah, I can't think of an instance where that was relevant to gameplay. Though there is a creature that looks kind of like a flying lion uh, that has the three eyes across its face and the Hlaka can control them. Mm -hmm. So there's one place where it matters. Yeah. And def um, the, way you the way you describe that, it, so it sounds like there's... Like, just, like um, there, there can be a lot of... There, would it be fair to say that there can be a fair, that can there can be a bit of debate when it comes to creatures that share that share similar um, traits? Yeah, it's, I mean the the planet is just a crazy grab bag of things, and not on top of the fact that we've got creatures from other planets, right, that were imported, mm -hmm. um, like humans. Humans brought dogs and cats, right, and the uh, and the uh, um, the, the other different races brought their things that they were familiar with, but also you've got the original, uh, some of the original flora, flora and fauna uh, still existing. Like there's patches of this stuff called food of the Sioux that's a, a plant creature that's sort of like bulbous, purple, red blobs that grow in patches, and they're hideously toxic. If you'd like touch them, you'll get you'll get welts all over your hand. Mm -hmm. um, so all of that is coexisting. Plus, there's, um, as, a, as a, it connected to the fact that magic works in this pocket dimension, uh, the, the science fiction-y justification for magic is that the skin of reality, in scare quotes, between different dimensions is thin here. And that's why the tiny bit of psychic power that human beings have, uh, if it's just enough, you can poke holes through that skin of reality and draw energy or physical objects through from other dimensions. And that's magic, right? Mm -hmm. But that means things from other dimensions can also come here. So there are underworld creatures that you can encounter that are you know, leftover summonings from ancient sorcerers that have been drawn in here from uh, by other uh, from other dimensions by by uh, magic users or their ancestors. You know, I don't know. I don't know if they're supposed to be breeding down there or what. Mm -hmm. And there's the undead, right? Um, undead creatures in Tecamel are simply dead bodies that have been reanimated through use of other planar power. So that's yet another source for things that are tromping around trying to kill you. Um, so it's just, it's a crazy mix of things that you can encounter. All right, I, get, I can, um, I can definitely see that. Now, since you brought up, since you brought up the concept of um, magic, yeah. I do want. I do want to um, delve in, delve into that now. Obvi obviously, you've made clear that magic is some is a benefit of the of this um, dimensional cutoff that Tecumel yeah. is in. But yeah. when it comes to when it comes to the use of magic, is it some is it something that is inherent? Is it something that is studied? Is it is it a, is it a case of memorization? Um, both. So not everybody is particularly capable of, uh, of, of using magic because of their, their personal uh, uh, amount of uh, uh, pedetal, which is the Soliani word for um, your um your magical power mm -hmm. uh, and so uh th what the temples do i i should mention the temples in we're just talking about the empire of solyanu now because mm -hmm. all of those all these cultural details are likely 
uh, slightly or completely different in other lands. But Solyanu is the main is the main focus of the books and the game. Um, what the temples do, since they are the uh, they are the, te the the centers of learning for the empire, there aren't like individual schools much to speak of. Um, but uh, the so the the wealthy send their children to the temple schools to be trained in uh, skills. Uh, and and the temples handle the teaching of magic. So just comparing this to Dungeons and, Dungeons and Dragons, mm -hmm. the, the only real difference um, skill-wise and uh, between a, or capability-wise, between a sorcerer and a priest is that a sorcerer is somebody who learned magic at the temples and then went into business for themselves. And a priest, assuming we're even talking about a priest who is capable of magic and, the, and then studied it, because there are priests in this culture who are not magic users at all, um, a, a magic using priest is someone who learned their sorcery at the temple and then remained part of the temple's hierarchy. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, but the, the spells they have access to are identical, but which ones you might choose to learn could be different. Like if you're working at the temple, you're, you're concerned with the things your temple would be concerned with. And providing those services, whereas an, an individual spellcaster down at the marketplace, uh, you know, doing uh, doing spells for a handful of coins, right? He might he might want to focus on things that your his customers might be interested in him. Yeah, that that makes sense. Now, a bit of a bit of a side question, since you mentioned when it comes to sorcerers that that there are people who go into business for themselves. Does that um, create tension between sorcerers and priests, or is that a um, varied factor? Um, good question. Uh, not so much, but uh, on the question of spells, there are, there are spells that are known by all of the temples, and they are the, mo the simpler and more generic general purpose ones. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and generally speaking, the, the, least, the less powerful ones. Then there are some spells which are known only to some of the temples, and that tends to be uh, you know, based on what those temples are focused on like um, the Temple of Thumis. Uh, I'm going to have to explain the religion here in a minute, yeah. uh, but I'll, I'll try to get through this first. The Temple of Thumis, the god of wisdom, uh, may know some of the same spells as the Temple of Avanthe, who is like the, 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 the goddess of women and women's concerns, um, may, have, may have much crossover uh, and and not but not so much crossover with the temple of Karakhan, who is a war god, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then there are even deeper, more powerful spells that are unique to specific temples, and it is a huge uh, breach if somebody from one temple learns one of the secret special spells of another temple. I mean, they will they they will take up arms over stuff like that. So that it so the answer to your question was no, it's not there's not that much conflict between um, uh, sorcerers and priests uh, just because of how they make a living. Uh, but they're there are issues of of conflict related to the sharing of secret magical knowledge between temples, or rather, the non-sharing of, of secret magical knowledge. Mm -hmm. So let me let me go off on a tangent here about the religion. So, um, so Takamel's in this pocket dimension where the skin of reality between it and other dimensions is thin, and so. Uh, 
also there are beings that they call the gods. So what are the gods? Well, uh, some believe that they are in fact the gods and they are gods in every sense that anybody means when they say gods. And at the far other extreme, some believe the gods are just really powerful interdimensional entities that have that have come to Tecumel to get people to do what they want. Um, and that's another thing I love about this setting is there are honest, reasonable, like theological discussions that you can get into. Barker never really comes down on one side or the other of this issue, but just leaves it open. Um, so it's, and, and it's, uh, it, so if one wants to believe that the, that the world is more of a traditional fantasy setting, you're fine just going with the idea that the gods are gods. What are you talking about? They are gods. Or uh, in his novels, and like I think the very last novel, he introduces this like secret group of terrorists who are called the um, blasphemous accelerators. The blasphemous accelerators believe that the gods are holding humanity back from regaining uh, their uh, humanity's lost ancient technological expertise and that what humanity needs to do is throw off the yoke of the gods and return to the stars. Um, so who's right? He doesn't, he doesn't really take a stand. It's more like these guys are in there doing their thing. And all the you know representatives of these different forces are in there doing their things. And uh, and then it plays out the way it plays out. So, um, uh, so, the, so let me talk about the gods. I'll mm -hmm. put scare quotes on because I'm a blasphemous accelerator myself. <laughs> uh, uh, the the so throughout um, the hundred thousand years, should I be saying two hundred thousand? I can never remember. Uh, since the since the disaster, right? At some point, humans contacted entities that were, they started calling the gods. And uh, uh, the magic doesn't come from the gods, but the gods clearly exist in that there are manifestations of their actions that clearly have occurred, no question. Um, and uh, so whether they are really gods or whether they're just powerful demons, because demon in Tecumel is just a word for a thing from another plane that doesn't belong here. Mm -hmm. Some demons are nice and some demons are not nice. Uh, uh, the, the humans started, you know, worshiping these things. And it's not clear whether the gods even particularly care about the worship. There doesn't seem to be um, a, a, a situation like the gods get their power from the people worshiping them exactly. Or maybe there is. It's hard to tell. Um, so uh, yes, people are the, the descendants of the survivors of the catastrophe started worshiping things. And over the course of many um, centuries, many millennia, uh, the, the these these beliefs got codified and you know one society would meet another society and go oh we worship zargu and uh, we worship karnan oh zargu and karnan are in fact you know different aspects of the same god and so let us henceforth be friends no uh, we we must call him karnan and if you call him zargu we will destroy you and you know so religious wars and stuff um the current a uh, prevailing civilization or culture, I should say, or cultural line goes back some some many, many, many uh, thousands of years um, to the, uh, oh, I'm going to have to look them up, not the Bednalsians, the uh, Engsvanyali, the empire of Engsvanyalu was this big empire that uh, united or conquered, I should say, much of the planet. And um, uh, they, uh, 
uh, uh, there was they began with the discoveries of this priest named Pavar who lived on a little island in the southern ocean and uh, contacted the gods and codified a way of looking at the gods that like said no 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 there are in fact there are in fact 20 there are 10 gods of stability and there are 10 gods of change exactly 10 mm -hmm. on each side and they are sort of mirror images of each other one being for stability and one being for change i'll explain that in a moment mm -hmm. and then each of them each of the 10 has a cohort who's sort of a less powerful but more fanatically focused uh, 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 sub-god or assistant god. And that's what there are. There are these 20. And all the ones we've ever heard of, they either fit into this structure or they're not gods, or they are what we call pariah gods, which I can get to mm -hmm. later. And this is what there is, right? And uh, uh, religious wars were fought over this way of looking at things. And uh, the, the winner of those wars said, yes, Pavar is correct. That's the way it is. And they formed a, a, uh, a, a the uh, empire of the priest kings of Engsvang Laganga. Uh, that's the name of the island. And conquered a big chunk of the world. And the Solyani Empire which is the the second imperium is um uh, they that's the current civilization they hearken back to the ancient Engsvaniali for their understanding of things and you know sort of like sort of like people in the US look back at Europe and think that oh european things are so fancy and we should be like we should have things like that um uh, so, change and stability. Um, uh, in the original Empire of the Petal Throne game, Barker, who was trying to fit his creation into the D&D &D paradigm, uh, went with the words good and evil for his gods. Mm -hmm. um, but the second game he came out with, uh, and in the novels, he makes it clear that no, not exactly. Um, Stability is, a, uh, the gods of stability are the gods who are lined up behind this ultimate goal of making everything perfect and clean and beautiful and unchanging for eternity eventually, right? That's their eventual cosmic goal. And the gods of change are lined up behind the goal of eventually turning the cosmos the multiverse into a place of unchanging unending uh fluctuation and uniqueness and creativity and uh and you know stability is boring sameness is boring the, the thing that is this way today should be different tomorrow that's their that's their ultimate cosmic goal. Mm -hmm. And the difference between the individual gods are their, their focuses in those efforts. So on the side of stability, we have Karakhan, the god of war, who is all about military discipline and uh, using military force, force for uh, the state. And... Um, and, uh, and stuff like that. Whereas on the side of change, we have Vimukhla, the god of flames, who is all about using military force to uh, conquer those who have the things you want, to exert your will, to force your, uh, your, your, uh, your views, and to, and to have things your way, mm -hmm. right? That's stability versus change as it as it manifests for humans. And this is the same kind of dichotomy exists through all the gods. Uh, on the, uh, the, the gods of stability have like a chief god, Nala, who's kind of like the cheerleader for all the other gods of stability. And the gods of change have Hu'u, who is this, you know, 
um, ultimate flux kind of everything should should change and mutate all the time god uh and um this is where it gets a little tricky for me because according according to barker you're supposed to be able to have good people by our by our view when you know we measure goodness by like human the value of human life right and the importance of peace and uh, and getting along and, and and justice and all that kind of stuff. That's and 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 you should also be able to find you should be able to find people like that on the side of stability and on the side of change. Mm -hmm. That that's more like on Tecumel, That's more like an individual uh, slant to your philosophical views, and, and the religion is sort of a separate issue from that. But Barker doesn't seem to be able to stop himself from presenting the gods of change as pretty evil by our standards. I mean, Vimuchla, if he really, if he had his way, if people were fanatical Vimuchla worshippers would just be burning everything and gleefully, you know, cheering at destruction. Uh, and Dlamelish, who is the the opposite of Avante, who I mentioned before, right? Avante is the stability goddess of women. Dlamelish is the change goddess of women, who you'd think could be presented as, you know, she's the goddess of like sex positive stuff, right? Or or lady warriors, or you know, whatever. You could put it, you could put a change spin on that that was still pretty easy for modern day Americans to accept as uh, as having room for good. But Barker seems to spend a lot more time talking about how the Temple of Delamelish is all about, you know, veneration of various rather extreme uh, um, fetishes. <laughs> and uh, um, you know, some of that is okay, but I mean, really extreme getting into like necrophilia and coprophilia and stuff, right? So, uh, it's hard to see how there's room for that. Me personally, mm -hmm. I'm a transhumanist. I don't know if you know what that is. And if you I, don't, I do ask me. And I'll, okay. <laughs> so I'm a transhumanist on the side of change. Uh, uh, I'm, so each of the, each of the two camps have a death God. On the side of stability, there is uh, Belkanu, and Belkanu is the god of like the transition from life to death. The temple of Belkanu actually handles funi funerary uh, 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 services for almost all of the other temples, stability or change, because that's what they do, right? Um, and I should mention, one of the ways that they know that the gods exist is they know that the afterlife exists. Part of yourself survives death and goes off to the the paradises of Tara, Taratane, which are like the, the where all the the heavens of the different gods are, right? And there's actually spells for communicating with departed souls. So it's it's clear that it's that that. that that the afterlife is a real thing but on the side of change the god of death is Sar sarku who is the god of the undead and the god of the undead is uh his focus is not on um life but on continuing to exist without the limitations of biological life right so if you're a if you're a, 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 a worshiper of Sarku in good standing, your big hope is that your body will be animated by other planar power, and your intellect will survive in that body past death, and continue to serve Sarku. And there's different levels of of uh, of spells that turn people into undead, going all the way from the lowest level spells, which make you into a murr, that's like the closest D and D analog would be a skeleton. Mm -hmm. um, and then above that, there's the Shedra, 
which is more like a zombie. It's got more flesh on it and a little more happening upstairs. And at the very highest level, there are the, um, oh, come on, Jeff, remember your words. Uh, there are the Jajki. Mm -hmm. And Jajki are essentially Anne Rice vampires. And, you know, as speaking as a transhumanist, I'm right with Sarku and want to be a Jajki. Uh, uh, not because of the vampire connection, because, but because, wow, uh, continuing to exist in a in a very well functioning, not decaying body for eternity. Mm -hmm. That sounds pretty reasonable to me. And yet, Barker doesn't seem to recognize that aspect of his own creation. And Sarku is pretty universally represented in a way that you even I don't want to have anything to do with. Because they're very, very, very creepy and dark, you know. Um, so, so anyway, uh, I'm just getting into the, into what, what I found fa find fascinating about the setting is that there's actually room for theological debate um, yeah. within the context of his creation. So, so anyway, the gods. Uh, the gods do not provide spells. The gods are there to be worshipped, uh, and there's... Uh, it's not exactly clear what humanity gets out of it, except for occasional really major things, mostly having to do with fighting off the pariah gods that I mentioned earlier, who are some entities that fall outside of the uh, Pavar's pantheon of 20. And uh, uh, they're, they're described as, you know, Sarku might want everybody on the planet to become undead and and just exist that way forever which for some reason is supposed to be bad it's certainly bad i think for the murr and the shadra um but the pariah gods want to end existence period right they just want to consume reality and make it not exist anymore uh so, so they're they're really bad, and everybody can agree to um, to uh, that they're against them. Mm -hmm. uh, but they but the pariah gods uh, still have a toehold on the planet, and they manage like sort of like you know servitors of Cthulhu. Uh, you wonder why would anybody want that, right? Why would anybody mm -hmm. be into that? And well, you know, the gods can offer you a little like uh, temporary gifts that make your life happy or give you power or whatever for now uh, before they they emerge from their undersea tomb and kill everyone. Yeah. Um, so it's sort of like that with the Brian right. guys. But even that's, yeah, you know, I see this, I'm, the tech is so, is so deep. Um, mm -hmm. uh, one of the pariah gods, I'll, I'll just mention the three that I know, there's the one who is the goddess of the pale bone she who will be who is not to be named and then there's the one other and um the one other is actually apparently involved at some level in the ceremony that uh crowns the new emperor when the old emperor dies so and i'm, I'm i don't know exactly what the one other is supposed to do in that but so the pariah gods, even even given that they are sort of universally recognized as bad, uh, they still have a place. Um, wow, I've gone off on a huge tangent about the <laughs> gods. We were talking about magic. Mm -hmm. I wanted to make the point that magic doesn't come from the gods. Magic mm -hmm. is just a thing. Uh, that the discovery of spells on Tecumel is more like a science. Like there's this phenomena in this pocket dimension. Now, how do we make it go? And human beings figured that out. And the temples teach magic not because the religion has anything to do with magic directly, but because the temples are the institutions of institutions of learning. Um, so, uh, do you have any other questions? <laughs> yeah. um, well, I was going to ask about the pariah gods, but you got, you kind of oh, you kind of okay. dipped into that. Um, yeah, the pariah gods are cool because the um, they're you know 
you could just as easily ask you uh, earlier you asked about you know is there any conflict between sorcerers and priests mm -hmm. and there's not really but there's also kind of not and kind of is a conflict between the temples of stability and the temples of change mm -hmm. um the the that empire of engsvang laganga the engsvang yali uh, that empire was able to arise because the temples of stability and change signed an agreement the concordat which says we're gonna rule together and not be on each other's case all the time right because mm -hmm. we're we're at least all we're, we're all following members of the same pantheon right why can't we just all get along which worked uh to the extent that they were able to for, uh, form a huge empire that lasted for tens of thousands of years but doesn't work when you consider that once you get outside of civilization where nobody can see what's happening um conflicts like direct open violent even conflicts between priests of the opposite persuasion are not at all uncommon mm -hmm. Um, but morally speaking, uh, the Tsoyani moral system isn't about what we call good and evil. The Tsoyani moral system, which they inherited from the Ingsmanyali, mm -hmm. uh, is about um, uh, right action. Okay, It's about, are you fulfilling your obligations given your place in society so um it is and and they have the word lan which means it's no uh, noble action and busan which is ignoble action it is lan for a peasant to go out into the fields and toil all day long and come back to get his crust of bread mm -hmm. it is it would be busan for that same peasant to take up arms against his master, you see. So uh, eh, it's tricky from from our perspective with our uh, you know modern uh, uh, Western uh, view of right and wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, and on the religious front, it is lan for a uh, priest of Vimukla to cast a screaming captive into the a flaming pit as a sacrifice to Vimuhla. It would be Busan for a priestess of Avanthe to do the exact same thing because um, that's not what that goddess wants. That's not the, 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 that priestess's role in society. And, uh, and yet, when out of view of of, uh, of of anybody else, if a lone priestess of Avante had an opportunity to stop a lone priest of Vimukla from doing a human sacrifice, um, she might well step in, all the while having to admit, I am not doing this because the priest of Vimukla is evil, uh, he's clearly doing, fulfilling his role in society. I am doing it because I find it distasteful and I'm in a position where I'm able to get away with interfering. Mm -hmm. um, it's much more a samurai kind of, you know, respect for your opponent sort of thing. That's, mm -hmm. that's a level on which I find it easier to grasp, right? You don't kill the other guy necessarily because he's so bad and deserves to die you kill him because it is your duty to do this thing and it was his duty to do that thing and well one of us won it's fun it's funny right. that you mentioned samurai um because er earlier this week i was having a discussion on um, on the con on the concept of honor and how mm -hmm. oh how um the how the concept of honor as we as we understand it has significantly changed from what from what it what from what it was interpreted initially um like when it comes to the concept of the samurai honor you can and i'm 
I'm very much summarizing this. You can split it into two kinds of fashions, external and internal. External is hor is horizontal and ver and vertical honor among your among your peers and your own personal achievements. Um your own personal actions, period. Whereas internal relatively speaking is a newer concept. It's more in Samurai culture it was something that came in the aftermath of Miyamoto Musashi's The Book of Five Rings, basically placing a lot of um, honor culture under a microscope. <laughs> and, a and that was when there was the turn towards internal honor, the, ki the kind of internalized um, code of ethics or code of honor that you would, s that you would see... A lot in the Romantic era, and a lot in a lot in the um, a lot in the age of chivalry, with sh with aspects of chivalry, aspects of universal brotherhood, and and the like. Um, even to this day, you have the you a common attack in debates is is um hypocrisy when somebody is not living up to their personal um honor code, whatever that may happen to be. Would it be fair of me to say right. that a lot of instances of uh, of honor codes or, the, or their equivalent within different Tecumel societies is more on the external end of that spectrum? Um, uh, yes, but it's external in the sense that um, right action to the Tsuliani is what gets you into the heaven of your deity it's not even i mean it's not even something judged by your fellow humans um though they're gonna react right uh it's not up to your fellow humans it's up to your god so that's what the teachings of the god are what establish what right uh, in part what right and wrong actions are for you as a worshiper but there's there's more to it than just religion but um it's even the parts that aren't religious like the social parts like you know i'm yes i'm a, a good honorable peasant i i i slave away all day to do what i'm told because that is my place in society yay me um, Thumis, the god of wisdom who I worship, is going to totally get me a fast track to uh, 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 a, a peasant hut in the afterlife where I can go on doing this. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, uh, so, yes, I think that the, my answer to your question is yes. Yeah. And, you know, they, the, the, so then individual questions of, you know, does that does that Avante priestess, priestess from my example, you know, raise her mace and go crush the Vimukla priest's skull and set the, uh, set the captive free, uh, is more about her as a person, her, her personality, and less about, uh, and, and, uh, and less about some objective moral standard in Tecumel. Mm-hmm. Which it makes it it makes it tricky. Uh, on one on one level, I should say, it makes it tricky. Once you get it, it's um, it makes it frighteningly easy to decide what your character wants to do <laughs> in a role playing game. Yeah, right. Because it's it, 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 it there's it's in some ways much more rigid, but in other ways uh, quite freeing. It just got to get a grasp of where those freedoms and limitations are. Now, uh, oh, and, oh I, I wanted to throw in one more thing uh, about now. Now, if I can remember it, uh, one more thing about the religion. No, I've lost it. Go ahead and with your question. Yeah, um, I got to write these things down. <laughs> one one particular th one particular thing that. I ended up seeing when I was do when I was doing research on the um, on the various types of magic is the uh, is the um, pre is the presence of psychic, which 
is very interesting to me because a lot of times when I see fantasy settings trying to in, trying to integrate magic and um and and psychic effects, there's always a bit of a clash where one side ends up losing out. Typically, typically the psychic end of things, with um, Dungeons and Dragons, of course, being the most infamous exa infamous example of of one side <laughs> losing out. And I'm cur I'm curious how Takumel ba um, strikes that balance to make sure that psychic isn't necessarily dipping into the same pool or the same t the same pond as um, magic. So. Yeah, so really the there really all magic on Tecamel is psychic at a certain to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. Because all magic on Tecamel involves the sor the sorcerers uh the sorcerer using their skill and their pedetal to open up rifts between the dimensions to make things happen. Mm -hmm. The really the difference between ritual and psychic magic on Tecumel is that ritual magics are things that uh, where to make the effect happen requires reinforcement from reagents and gestures and incantations and so on. And psychic effects are ones that can be triggered purely by the mind. That's really the only difference. It's it's more of a it, it's more of a, a stylistic difference. Though there are some game effects, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you're tied up, you can still use your psychic spells, which is why the Solyani love to put uh, iron collars on sorcerers because iron disrupts magical power. On yeah. Um, is it just iron or is it you... metals? Period. I believe it's just iron, actually. Um, to the best of my knowledge, off the top of my head, it's just iron. Which you know, since iron is rare and expensive, um, that makes that that defense against sorcery a little difficult. Uh, I might have to. Don't don't quote me on that. I could be wrong. It could be other kinds of magic or other kinds of metal as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, so it's actually, you know, um, psychic magic isn't really a completely distinct thing mm -hmm. on Tecamel. It's just the spells that don't require all the other rigmarole. Those are purely psychic spells and all the other ones are psychic spells, but you also gotta jump through other hoops to get the, the effect to go off. Fire and forget, essentially. Uh, I'm so uh, I don't think I'd characterize it that way exactly. <laughs> it's because you could, you, I mean, you can fire and forget a ritual spell too. It just takes it takes more doing to get the ritual spell to happen in the mm -hmm. first place. Um, now, when it comes when it comes to the when it comes to the um, the five empires. Um, yeah. The which I'd imagine that I'd imagine that these are the major um, major political and mil and military um, movers and shakers on Tecumel. And of those movers and shakers, mm -hmm. would it be fair of me to say that Solianu is the largest, or at least the one that has the most pull? Um. So they are the movers and shakers of the known world, mm -hmm. but you got to be aware that Barker never really um, mapped out more than, you know, a third of one hemisphere, maybe approximately, uh, in any detail. So who knows what's going out on in other parts of the planet? Um, and. Uh, Solyanu, you ask any Solyani, they will absolutely tell you that theirs is the preeminent empire of the five. But it's not like they are in a position to go conquer the other four just any time they want to. So it's more of a balance. Um, though that balance is not always 
purely a matter of military force that, you know, there are other factors like geography and, and so on. Uh, I should also mention of the five empires, you know, four of them are all inheritors of this uh, previous Bednaljan, I'm sorry, Engsvanyali empire, the mm -hmm. Bednaljan worked for them. Uh, the Engsvanyali empire. And so they're all quite similar though with different different local exceptions like um the Mu'ugalaviani to the west uh worship the 20 uh gods of Bavar plus this extra entity called Hirsch who is sort of a combination of the Mukhla and Kru'u um who's just like a badass kind of destruction god. Mm -hmm. um, so that makes them different. And culturally, they're much more... I mean, the, the, the Tsoyani are rigid and bureaucratic and um, conservative and hidebound. The Mughlaviani are downright Nazis. Um, then, now they're to the west. To the north, you have Yon Kor, and Yon Kor is the really weird exception that, like, was sort of rural bumpkins for a long time, and they've pulled their shit back together more recently than the other empires, and they are um, a matriarchal society, and all of their gods are a little different. Like, apparently because of, you know, millennia of being isolated and their religious, uh, uh, their memories of the, of the, of the uh, Engsvanyali religious system sort of drifting. Then to the east, you have the Salarviani, who are... Um, I think more similar to the Tsoyani than anybody would like to say, but they're also a huge territory that wraps like fully a quarter of the way around the planet. And, uh, and so they are very, uh, they're very broken up into little warring city states. And also, um, they don't have the Tsoyani goddesses Avanthe and Lamelish. They have a single goddess, goddess Shiringayi, who is a combination of Avanthe and Lamelish, mm -hmm. uh, which the Tsoyani look at and go, Ugh. it's like mom, but she's all dressed in like, you know, leather and spikes and shit. <laughs> uh, so, so those are those are the other uh, those are the other three empires that are that are continuations of the Engsvanyali. Then the final uh, empire of the five is the uh, Livyani, and the Livyani are their whole other thing. They have a completely different pantheon uh, of the shadow gods, and it's not terribly clear on the surface what the shadow gods are all about. They all seem kind of dark and creepy. And also in the middle of Livyanu, there is this one city whose name I'll try to remember, uh, Dlash. Mm -hmm. Dlash, which has a very, very thin walls between it and other dimensions. And so there's a lot of, of truck between the Liviani and creatures of other planes. So they're, they're very mysterious. And yeah. that's, there, there's an overview of, uh, of the five empires. Yeah. They also have each have a, a relatively distinct like main color on the battlefield that they lacquer their armor. In. The Tsoyani are blue, Wuglaviani are red, Yankriani are green, uh, Salarviani are yellow, and the uh, Liviani are white. I think I've got that yeah. right. And since you mentioned that, and, give, and given um, 
given the given the kind of game that Bar that um, Barker designed with with um, War of Wizards, um, oh yeah, talk to me about the about the way that the empires wage war. Um, obviously, I'd I'd imagine that given the technology level, it's still emphasizing open battlefields, but. Would, for example, things like siege combat not be a thing yet, or is that, or is that, um, something that can that can happen? Siege combat is a thing. In fact, it, the, a particular siege features very prominently in uh, recent Soliani history. Um, in fact, the cover of the rule book of Empire of the Petal Throne has this uh, woman on a throne with a military guy facing her. And it's a scene from the end of that siege where the Tsoyani forces are conquering this city. And that woman is the wife or girlfriend of Baron Ald from Yon Kor. And um, she is promptly taken out and impaled uh, after that scene if I'm remembering my details correctly. And uh, that sends Baron Ald off the deep end, and he uh, he uh, leads uh, Yon Kor in a war against Solyanu, which was going on for most of the time that Barker was, uh, from the release of Empire of the Petal Throne, through all of Barker's life and the novels. No, that's not true. Um, it ends... I'm sorry, I'm, I'm completely wrong on that. It ends at, uh, in the third novel. The main characters get word back from uh, back from home because they're out on an island past Livianu on a diplomatic mission. And they, they hear that there's a new emperor and the new emperor has basically made a pact with the, with the uh, younger Yanni and the war is over. Uh, but don't get me started on that emperor. He was a piece of work. Um, uh, or, or do, if that's the place <laughs> you want to go with your questions. Um, uh, now, when you, so, when you say... Uh, so you were asking, mm -hmm. but you were asking specifically, let me answer this, mm -hmm. this question first, yeah. right? So, yes, there's sieges. Um, uh, so the... Uh, I'll just talk about Solyanu. Mm -hmm. Different countries have their own takes on this, right? But in Solyanu, um, military legions tend to be uh, organized and funded by temples or clans uh, and then offered up to the empire to fight on behalf of the empire. It's a way for, for a temple or a clan to, to um, show its support for the empire. Um, uh, there, so there's no like central uh, imperial uh, army, really. I mean, other than there's the omnipotent Azure Legion, which is the imperial secret police. And I think they can field some units of troops, but mostly they're not about that. Mostly they're the guys that come knocking on your door when the empire has gotten word that you might've done something wrong. Uh, uh, so, uh, so the empire has this army made up of all these disparate legions, and then uh, uh, the 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 empire decides where to send the legions to to fight on various fronts, and uh, and those legions consist of you know there's there's your heavy infantry, your light infantry, your skirmishers, your your slingers, your archers, your artillery, um, uh, their sapper legions, uh, and stuff like that. There aren't, um, there aren't totally dedicated magic legions, but most or possibly all of the legions have a magic using contingent uh, doing battlefield magic. Mm -hmm. And now, when when it comes to when it comes to artillery, um, is that is that artillery include including um, black powder? Or no, the... there's no gun no gunpowder on Tecumel that right. that I know of. I mean, obviously it would work, 
I just think they don't, they either don't know it or the, the Soyani consider it like, you know, a toy because a magic user can produce the same or even more powerful effects with magic. So would a, um, not, would a non-magical form of artillery be something akin to an arbalest? Yeah, trebuchets, onagers, onagers, I've never been sure how that's pronounced. Um, uh, catapults, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, the other question I had when it came to warfare is, are there, in, are there any nations oh. that might engage in using a pike square? Uh, hold, that, hold that thought. I want to throw in one more mm-hmm. thing on the subject of, of, of artillery. Mm-hmm. The Empire also has a stockpile of devices of the ancients, including the uh, things called lightning bringers. That's what they're called these days, which are basically like energy ray tanks uh that they can bring out they're not usually they don't usually resort to that because these are like ancient artifacts that if they were lost would be a tremendous blow uh so you don't often see them in the field but they got them and also uh air cars which are flying flying vehicles um uh, that I think there might be some armed ones, but definitely they've they've got them for like long distance, distance travel and and scouting and stuff. Again, not often brought out, but they exist. Yeah. Uh, now, you, so moving on to your next question, uh, I don't know the answer to that because I haven't dug deep into the uh, uh, the military uh, simulation end of things. Yeah. But I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, it's it's one it's give, given given how given how a lot given how a lot of warfare um worked in in say the Pike and Shot era, it's definitely something I could it's definitely something I could see. Um, not 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 exactly the same way that the that um the Swiss did it in our world, but not but something not far removed from it. And uh-huh. probably ju- and probably just as gruesome to look at. There's you know uh, something you might try to find definitely in PDF. Uh, I'm I'm sure it's a oh gosh I'm not sure. I hope it's available and mm-hmm. it might even be not that hard to find in print. Is a book called um uh oh come on Jeff remember it um. Oh, Deeds of the Ever Glorious is a Tecumel, um s- s- book uh, written by Professor Barker that is histories of the different legions of the Empire. Mm-hmm. And it's hugely fascinating, um, just as, as much a source on uh, cool cultural and historical things as it is on military things. Mm-hmm. Um, recommended. Now, a quick side thing when you mention when you mention legions. Now, of course, when I hear when I hear the term legion, I immediately think of the um, varied size of a Roman imperial legion, which, um, depending on the era, what could be could be around two thousand or even more um, legionnaires. But what I'm curious about is the way you've described it. Would it be fair to say that? individual legions are specialized towards a given task. Yeah, they they tend to fall into like standard, you know, ritualized even categories like heavy infantry, um, uh, light infantry, and so on, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so the vast majority of the troops in that legion will be guys that do precisely that. Uh, then plus a, mili- uh, a magical contingent, and um, then there's you know maybe some uh, sprinkling of special purpose guys in there on top. Mm-hmm. Of and with uh, with all with all of with all of that, the um, the last question that I'm, that I'm going to go on and and. Um, and I'll and I'll um put I'll wrap I'll wrap it up there is when it com- is when it comes to 
Oh, when it comes when it comes to the when it comes to um Sulianu it's Sulianu itself, which is ref, which is referred to as uh -huh. the Empire of the Petal Throne. Where does the where what can you tell me about the about why it's referred to as the Petal Throne? Oh, so the Sulyani Emperor sits upon actually he sits behind a screen in his throne room and the screen has like flowery filigree kind of designs on it and it's an ancient artifact which uh enforces like psychically enforces loyalty in those who approach it or pass through it or something Mm -hmm. Though there are rumors that it isn't working as well as it used to. Also, I've never quite entirely exactly understood how this how this operates because nobody's allowed to see the emperor. So maybe this screen is just by itself in a room and you're ushered up to it or through it or something. And the emperor uh, exists in seclusion and communicates through speaking to tubes to the people that come and see him. All right. uh, but that's why it's called that. The mm -hmm. Petal Throne is the artifact that um, that the Emperor uses to enforce loyalty. Oh, all right. And, and the fact that it's breaking down, that's mm -hmm. that's, <laughs> that's that's scary. That is scary <laughs> for the Empire. Yeah. Um, but with, the, with that said, and not obviously the um, there's a lot. There's a lot more to go. There's a lot more to go into, which is, which I'm ho which I'm hoping if, if if um in the fu if in the future, we're able to con we're able to continue that continue this particular discussion because there's a there's a lot more there's a lot more to go into and every time, I get one I get one answer I end up having th I end up having three more qu I end up having three more questions. Can I just take a moment to mm -hmm. talk about? You know, we've we've mm -hmm. gone over all these details. But, yes. Um, I just want to talk for just a couple of minutes about mm -hmm. Tecamo as a role playing setting. Yes. Right. Um. So the reason that I love Tecamo so much is, yeah, I mean, we we could talk and talk and talk for hours. I mean, mm -hmm. literally, you could have a podcast that's just about Tecamo, and it could go on for a long time. In fact. There is the Hall of Blue Illumination podcast, which is a Tecamel podcast that has been going on for a long, long, long time. Um, uh, and and for some people, they find the sheer amount of stuff daunting. But the core stuff, the stuff you really need to have a grasp of in order to run a game there that's close enough to have all of the benefits of how cool the world is, isn't that much. And, uh, and uh, but, but what you get with the Tecamel setting is if you like, you know, D&D &D kind of adventures, you can have D&D &D kind of adventures on Tecamel, but it gives you all this room for context and ramifications for things that happen. You know, the complaint you sometimes hear about D&D uh, &D adventures being, you know, well, you're just some hobos in a tavern and you, you hear about a place where there's treasures and you just go and kill monsters and take their stuff. And there's no greater connection to the world or meaning to it all. And with Tecamel, you get that. Somebody, somebody controls that plot of land where the where the dungeon is right mm -hmm. somebody built that then that ties into the ancient history of the planet and it could be connected with a religion it could be connected with an ancient forgotten god but that ancient forgotten god could have been an earlier conception of the god um Xarul, the doomed prince of the blue room, right? The god of knowledge on the side of change. And that would get the temple of Xarul interested in the discovery. So there's 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 so many 
uh, connections you can make. Not that you have to make, because it's a big rambling planet, and these people don't have advanced communication technology. And, you know, just because you do something that you find out later, oh, shit, that was like hideously illegal. Yeah, but if it, it might take a century for a report of your crime to reach the authorities in the capital city and get acted on. So, you know, relax. Um, the, it, it just it gives you a lot of ammunition as a GM to make interesting, deeper uh, stories um, surrounding the player characters' adventures. Mm -hmm. And that's why I love it so much. Yeah. So, thank you. <laughs> thank you. It's, it's just, I, um, like I said, I, I, don't, I don't see my particular journey de delving into Tecumel ending, any, ending anytime soon. And if... If the star, if these stars align, I would love to have you back on to continue this kind of discussion. I would love to be on as many times as you want me to to go into any weird corners of TechML that you want. I I, <laughs> I sincerely appreciate and we could, that. In particular, I'd I'd be happy to talk about the uh, the the Bethorm rule set, which I wrote for TechML, since mm -hmm. I know you have an interest in mechanics. Yes. Um. And that that's that's something that that's something that can be planned for the, for the future. Uh, with that said, cool. I do want to sincerely thank you for for coming back up to the temple, and um, and enjoy and enjoying the particular brand of insanity that come that that goes down around here. Um, but it's, it's been my pleasure once mm -hmm. again. And and of course, a sincere thanks to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy to the enjoy the madness here. And there'll be plenty more at where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!